Topkapi Palace. I've been nuts. Yeah, all the harem. It was just like the jewels. It was just like one friend and the next. Hi.
But here's one that was written by Raymond Farland in 1911 uh, that really stresses the importance of this marine ecosystem of, to the history and, and also to our economics. The history because this is the area that first brought Europeans to the New World. They came, they came to Cobbage. No question about that in the late 1400s, early 1500s. So tremendous historic in, interest. In Newfoundland is where the first European settlements were in North America, first by the, the Vikings, then uh, by the English in the 15, uh, 1500s. And economic importance because the fish from the Grand Banks literally drove the European economy for hundreds and hundreds of years and fed a lot of the world. Now, most of this importance and most of this history is about one single species, the Atlantic codfish. It's only recently that there have been other fisheries uh, developed. So here we have an artist's depiction and an echogram of, of cod. And I'll, some of you who know me uh, know I do a lot of acoustic work, so you're going to see a few echograms here. Now, the cod stocks of Newfoundland, sometimes you hear, and it is Newfoundland, it's easy to say, I know a lot of people Newfoundland, the cod stocks are diverse and there are many of them. Some people, you will hear people talk about Newfoundland cod as if it's one stock, one unit. <clears throat> Far from the truth. In fact, there are many diverse uh, stocks that have different migration patterns. This is a bit of a cartoon uh, from my book and it's probably too coarse in texture. There are a lot of smaller uh, sub-regions and stocks within these areas that are not displayed. The size of these stocks varies from the northern fishery, which is the one that gets all the attention, and rightly so, because it was the biggest one, it was in the millions of tons, and that's in this area here. The Grand Banks would be second, and then there are many smaller stocks, right down to very tiny coastal stocks that range in the order of maybe 10,000 to 20,000 tons, but in, in that kind of order. So we have a broad, broad diversity of stocks, life histories, migration patterns, some of them don't migrate at all, a wide diversity of, of biology within the species. <clears throat> all of this becomes important, I hope you will see, in terms of what happened to these fish stocks and also what their future holds. Now, I can't resist putting this up. It, it's kind of out of place. I love to show this to European <coughs> audiences. But this is, there are many quotes like this too. When people first came to fish the Grand Banks, they really couldn't believe it. John Cabot, who was the first English explorer way back in about 1500, he, he went back to England and told the Queen, we can catch them with baskets. You know, we don't even need lines. We don't need anything. Just give us a couple of baskets. Couldn't believe the densities of fish that were encountered. And this, this quote here, which comes from about the 1700s, compares the, uh, well, this is the North Sea, basically, said that they were just, the numbers are so inconsiderable, they look like stragglers compared to what existed in Newfoundland. And this is a, a big cod here of a size that was quite common <coughs> until recently. I just want to give you some of the background to <coughs> the abundance of fish that was there. Now, there are some characteristics of these fish stocks which are notable and which I think it's very important to understand before we try to understand what happened to them and what the likely course of events will be. And a lot of these things are not really well understood or even well known or, or accepted. Uh, one is that this area had an incredibly high biomass, so there's a very high carrying capacity or, or K in the, in, the, in the jargon. Very high density and high aggregation. This is a uh, overwintering, pre-spawning cod school, actually, just from uh, two years ago. Northern cod, you can see, this is about 150 meters of fish stretching over scales of, of kilometers. So, very, very high, dense aggregations of fish in this area, which, which of course, has an impact on why catch rates are always so high, and so on, and also in why the decline wasn't recognized as quickly as it should have been. There are diverse populations, which I've mentioned. 
There are also very few species in the North Atlantic. Unlike the North Pacific, which is a very old ocean, rich with species, and there are hundreds of species of, of rockfish in the North Pacific. There are only about 150 species of fin fish in the entire North Atlantic. So it's a young ocean, it doesn't have very many species. <clears throat> and another thing which I want to stress is that the productivity or the R value, particularly of the cod stocks, which we know most about, is, is quite low. So you have this perceptual problem, and it, it really is a problem in dealing with industry and, and fisheries, where you have incredibly high biomasses, but very low productivity. And of course, as we all know in fisheries, we're, we're supposed to be harvesting productivity, not biomass, per se. And this is a very difficult thing uh, to deal with. <clears throat> Another thing is there's a very, very simple food web. It comes from a few species, and generally speaking, uh, I'll mention this in some detail later on in the talk, they're very simple food webs. Things are very dependent on usually one thing. Uh, load. And cold water and very good eating. Now, this is only put up there to be, to be silly uh, in some senses, but it's very important because when people found out how good these fish were to eat, it was difficult to restrain fisheries. So these are some of the characteristics that have impacted what's, what's happened. Now, just to kind of stress this, these are some recent cod aggregations. Now remember, these are collapsed stocks. Some people actually think the fish are gone. I had a, a, a recent graduate student came down from Alaska, now, now studying in Newfoundland. And he, was, he was amazed when he got to Newfoundland. And you know, we could go out and show him fish and say, I thought they were all gone. Everybody thinks they're all gone. Well, they're, they're, they're not all gone. And there's fish in the restaurant. And, and so on, but you know, there are not enough of us Newfoundlanders to eat enough fish to really have much of an impact on these stocks. So even when the fish are relatively scarce, which they are relative to what, don't get me wrong, what they have been, there are still large, large, dense aggregations of fish we found relatively easily. Now, in terms of productivity, we can look at this graph. Now, this looks at most of the cod, recognized cod stocks in the North Atlantic. And I, I classified these into three groups. The red, the, the real firecrackers, the green ones, which is kind of average, and the blue, the, the slow, slow growers. And all of our cod stocks, with the exception of one, are in the blue. In fact, we kind of dominate the blue. Our cod stocks are, of course, slow growing compared to most of the rest of them in the world. And again, this is very important from the standpoint of the fisheries. Another thing, and I haven't got time to go into this in any great detail, but I'm very interested in the history of all these, uh, these fisheries. And uh, I'll mention this a little bit later, but this is a reconstruction that I did. It was published some years ago on uh, the total land in the Newfoundland fishery from 1500 to uh, 2004 when we stopped that. And this is a series that um, I've got from Roseanne Garrigo, who's, uh, who uh, works at Columbia with tree rings. And this, these are productivity. This is an index of productivity from tree rings in, in Labrador. And one of the reasons I, I got onto this is because it's one of the only bits of data that go back as far as we want to go back at the kind of scales that we want to look at. So interestingly enough, in this you can see definitely long periods of 50 to 100 years of very high productivity and relatively low productivity. And then this, what we can see here right at the end when all, we got in the worst trouble that the fishers have ever been in, we see this going down to perhaps the lowest ever in a 500 year series. And it's hard to make too much of the early data because we just don't know enough about it. But what we do know is that the crisis in the fishery that exists right now is not the first one that's happened. It's definitely the most severe, but it's not the worst, it's not the only one. There was, there was one 
or actually two in the 19th century. They're well documented. There were lots of people around writing about this. And they wrote about the cold weather and the lack of fish and, you know, people were starving and all the rest of it. They occurred in here during periods of very low productivity in Labrador trees. And, of course, we know about this one. And even back here, there was a crisis in the early 1700s that we know a lot about. People actually moved south. They just cleared out, even during the summertime, out of Newfoundland. French fisheries that were prominent in Newfoundland prior to that all went to Nova Scotia and parts south, simply because <clears throat> fish were apparently gone. So we can get a lot out of this. I, I took this as, as, as far as producing, incorporating that tree ring data into a surplus production model, which was the only way that I could get anything to actually work. The idea behind that was that if there was no effect from the environment, as had been a hypothesis put out after the most recent decline, then the values of the R and K values of the surplus production model should be pretty constant over time. Well, it, it turns out that there's nothing to be further from the truth. You can't get anything to fit if you make those assumptions. By incorporating a couple of things, particularly a productivity index from the tree rings, it actually fit quite well in two periods of time. One with recent surveys and another with an index of CAT 300 effort that uh, was derived during the 19th century. And what it describes actually is this major decline that occurred in the 19th century, which is well documented through anecdotes, admittedly, but well documented to have occurred. <coughs> so productivity varies. And that's something I think that was not taken into account by stock assessments and by industry and so on in the 1980s. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more in, in a minute. But the other thing about simple food chains, here we have what the estimated diets of cod in the major areas of, of the Grand Banks. I'm going to use the Grand Banks in a kind of a loose way. We wouldn't do this at home, but I'll use it loose way to describe the whole area around Newfoundland. This would be and this is what they eat, basically, historically. Almost cake, all cake. And there have been various estimates made of this historically. And you know, it usually come out as 50 to 70 percent of the annual energy budget would come from eating cake. So these big, same is true, by the way, in, in the other, the two other big cod stocks in the North Atlantic, in Iceland and in the Barents Sea, where the cod are directly dependent on that abundance of Cape. This is of primary importance in what happened in the 1980s and early 90s and was discounted or just ignored in a lot of the early accounts. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of background. Now I just want to run through here, uh, just out of interest, nothing else, what 500 years of cod fisheries looked like. Now, I'm going to do this very quickly. So basically, we've got a 500-year fishery, and we can divide it basically into a number of parts. The first part, about 300 years of migratory fishery from Europe. Nobody lived in Newfoundland. Few people were left behind, you know, to look after the deer in the winter time. But that was about it. It's a harsh place. There's no getting around it. Settlement occurred late 1700s up to about uh, 1950, but mostly in the, in the 1900s. And it was a seasonal, local fishery. Seasonal being very important because it was only practiced at one, one time in the year, in the, in the spring to fall period when the fish were migrating. Then what's been called the killer spike, which was after the Second World War with the advent of ocean-going trawlers and all the rest of it. The Russians were hungry. They sent hundreds of trawlers over the Grand Banks. It was international waters at that time and caught a huge amount of fish. Stock decline followed pretty quickly. And then there's a, a year-round, everybody was fishing. Canadians largely responsible for, for this, this little peak. It doesn't look like much of a peak when you look historically, 
the chapter remembering this that the, that the abundance was declining quickly in this period. So it actually was. And then the post moratoria of cod fisheries are closed. Okay, the seasonal fishery. What characterized that? <coughs> Migration. Okay, Basque, French, English. They landed up to 200,000 tons a year, so it was a fairly intense short term. But the harvest rates, as far as we know, by these historic calculations, now, you know, there's a lot of room for error in this, obviously, but they were low, you know, by my estimations, less, less than 10%. There was management. People think, some people think that, oh, back in those, there was, you know, just a free for all, everybody's going everywhere, you go to one. No, it wasn't like that at all. In fact, there was very, very strict effort control. We had what were called fishing admirals. And the fishing admirals, there's a lot of stories about fishing admirals, which I won't go into, most of them are kind of funny, but, but a fishing admiral was the first skipper who showed up in the harbor that spring. And he ran the place, that was the rule. So it wasn't, you know, formal law. They controlled the effort. Nobody else could come into that place except if he said so. So what it was, was a very early form of effort control. Uh, and, you know, you just couldn't go and fish anywhere. And all the fishing was done along the coast. Now, there are many, many <coughs> old maps, which I've gleaned a lot of information from. This is an English map. And you can tell that not just because it's written in English, but because of where the fishing stations are. This was the English shore. And their knowledge, the English knowledge and map makers' knowledge of this area corresponds exactly to where they, they fish. Beyond that, they didn't have a clue. If you, look at, if you look at areas up here, it just looks like gibberish. And down here, it's completely inaccurate. If you looked at the French maps or Portuguese maps, you'd see the exact inverse of this. So you can learn a lot about the fisheries just by looking at these old maps. Um, I, I don't think you know that there was they had any noticeable impact on cod availability and biomass fishing at that level in, in this way. There's no certainly no evidence of it. So let's let's look at this next period. This is resident fishery. People started, they wanted to get out of Europe. They came to Newfoundland. People say, well, Newfoundland, that, that can't have been very good. Well, it's, must have been worse in Europe because lots of, <laughs> lots of people came out. They found freedom, if nothing else. And um, over time, the local fishery <coughs> just supplanted the migratory fishery. And there were some French and Portuguese fisheries that persisted into the 20th centuries, but they were relatively small. The landings went up 200 to 500,000 tons a year. Harvest rates were still probably less than 15 or 20 percent. And this is when, <clears throat> again, people thought no management is not true. This is what we would call birth control management. And what it, what it was, literally, was when the trap fishery particularly came into being, you had to have a birth, a place to set this gear. And those were, apps, those were identified everywhere, and you couldn't fish anywhere else. And who got the birth depended on the area. Sometimes they were, they were owned by the family. Other times, in other areas, uh, again, this was kind of area management, in other, other areas, they'd be auctioned off each spring or picked, picked out of a hat. <clears throat> but there was definitely effort control. This, in fact, this is where I did my PhD thesis. And the, the reason I, this is a long time ago now, as John alluded to, but you know, Time is irrelevant to this. These are the original fishing berths from the 19th century. And when I was there doing my PhD work, the exact same berths were being, being used. Nothing really had changed in, in terms of that. And to this, well, there, the, the fishery there is highly restricted now. But, but when it comes back, the same berths will be used again. So that's the kind of historic management there. The other important thing that happened in the 19th century was the seal fishery. It, it became an economic necessity. Now, I'm not going to go into any great detail on this because there's, there's a lot of economic information here. But this just shows the rise in population in Newfoundland on a log scale. So we start off with about you know, 1,000 people uh, in 1700, not very many, and then it rises fairly 
uh, quickly during this period. The only thing I want to point out from this is that the value of seafood products didn't change for over 100 years. Basically, the price didn't go up. And this is one of the reasons why there was a crisis in the end of the uh, 19th century. You had fewer fish at the same price that was 100 years ago. You can imagine how the economics of that played out. Anyway, if anybody's interested in that sort of thing, I can talk about it. But we'll move on to this period. Now, this is the period where all the trouble started. Uh, a literal invasion of the fishery. Two things are important here. The fishing mortality rates went sky high compared to anything they had been in the past. And the fishery became year-round. That is, no more were the spawning or the overwintering grounds. Those echograms that I showed you of the highly dense populations of fish, those are from the overwintering, pre-spawning, spawning period uh, when the fish were highly aggregated. Those uh, aggregations had never, ever been fished before. It was only the, the migrations inshore. So spatial, the spatial aspects of the fishery changed entirely, and as did the fishing mortality rates. And uh, with quite disastrous results. And you can see it here. It, it, it became almost a game. I tried to imagine what it must have been like back in those days. Um, but it became almost like, we've got the Olympics going on now, shortly in Vancouver. And this became like the Olympics of unfettered fisheries. And the back, this is put it in historical context. We're in the Cold War here between the East and the West. And this is a quote translated from a Soviet document that was written in uh, describing the 50s and early 60s. And they exceeded the USA and Europe in catch and took second place. It was, it was like the Olympics. Everybody was going for first place. Who could catch the most? You had this great abundance of fish. And it was the first time in history when there really had been unfettered fisheries. There had always been some sort of effort control, if nothing else, in these fisheries prior to this, and seasonal control. Uh, but this happened, and I'm going to pick on the Russians here because they were one of the worst culprits, but they, uh, they weren't the only ones. And this is what happened. Basically, uh, you see this, this is the foreign catch of the northern cod, only one stop. The foreign catch just spiked and then, then down. This part here is Canada's responsibility, which came later on in the 80s and 90s, <clears throat> when we tried as hard as we could to emulate what the foreigners had done to, to the stocks uh, with, with similar results, even worse results, because we were in a period of poor productivity. But that's, that's another story. And so we see the decline of all of the Newfoundland cod from an estimated total biomass of maybe six million tons historically uh, down to, oh, probably <clears throat> half a million tons in the, uh, around 2000 or something like that. <clears throat> now the changes that occurred recently were not just in terms of abundance, but in terms of the spatial dynamics. Now this is a series from, of the cod, uh, catches from 1987, 88, 89, 90, and then to 92. This is when the dramatic changes take place. So it, the changes, the point here is that the changes that occurred and the, the declines were not universal in space. They were definitely from the north down. And we see here by 1992, uh, there were virtually no cod in that northern area. Now this is commercial fish data, but the survey data would look almost exactly the same. So you, you've got a spatial shift going on uh, during, this, during this time. Now this has been written about, published, and, and denied by some people that it ever happened, but I think the, the weight of the evidence is quite clear now that it, it did happen. And in fact, this <coughs> shift that occurred was widespread across many Taxa. And this is, this is a, a, a map of what happened to Caitlin. Uh, they shifted it's a cod, Arctic cod, they were, by the mid-90s, the dominant biomass out in this area where 10 years earlier you couldn't find an Arctic cod, the dominant biomass was Arctic cod. 
they came down from, from the north, and they since retreated. You, you hardly, it's just like it was before. You can't hardly find one now. Uh, shrimp and crab, which I'll mention later on, increased tremendously. And even things down there, this is what we call slub, or white or plural, sea butterflies, whatever you call them. Fishermen hate them because they slub up everything. Uh, they became all over the place. These are, this is basically an Arctic species. So we had a, a clear influence of the environment in this period of the uh, late 80s and, and early 90s. <coughs> so in a nutshell, what went wrong with this? We, we, we lost the fishery, that's clear. What went wrong? Well, it really started with this unfettered overfishing <coughs> in the 1960s. But 80% of that catch was, was foreign at the time. There, there were no restrictions. And it's important to realize that a lot of people have looked at this decline, including myself and quite a few other people. And it, it's pretty clear that this decline was almost entirely a result of overfishing. In fact, it occurred, if we look at our, all of the productivity and the indices that we have, including the, the tree rings that, that I've been using, um, this was a time of very high productivity. Warm waters, strong recruitment, everything was, was, was doing good. So the decline here uh, in, in, in the 60s was, it's hard to, to find any environmental root to it at all. It, it was clearly simple overfishing, or so it seems. And that's one point. Now, but the other thing that, that's kind of an industry problem. Science also had some problems. One is the lack of recognition for these stocks of the productivity limits and, and the dynamics of those productivity limits. That is, people thought back in, in the 70s and 80s that these great boom years that had occurred in the 50s and 60s would just continue. The projections, why the Canadian fishery went so wrong in the 1980s, was projections were based on productivity levels that were totally unrealistic. We were in a period of strong productivity decline, according to what we know, and yet productivity was assumed to be what it had been in the 1950s and 1960s, and projections were made on that, fishing fleets were built on that basis, and so on and so forth. And as I'm sure you know, once you, once you create a fishing fleet, it will be used. You can be guaranteed of that. And that's kind of, what we need to do is recognize in this, in this particular ecosystem the productivity in this area is relatively low compared to other comparable cod stocks. We cannot fish these stocks as hard as, say, they do in Iceland, Norway, forget the North Sea or, or some of the higher uh, production areas. We just can't do that. If we do, disaster will result. There's also a lack of recognition, or was a lack of recognition of the spatial dynamics. <coughs> I remember as a, as a, well, I guess everything's relative, I can say a relatively young scientist, but in the, around 1990, when I was doing surveys at the time of uh, up the northern cod, and saw this, what we ended up calling hyper-aggregation of these schools in the, to the south, something that had never been Record had never been, you know, no anecdotal evidence, no evidence from the fishery that this has ever happened before. Big changes in the spatial dynamics. To me, and I, I remember this clearly, the red flag went off. Something's going on here. Something is wrong. And I remember having an interview with the Deputy Minister of Fisheries for Canada at the time and trying to explain this to him. And he, his interpretation was totally different. His interpretation was, this is great. Look at all the fish that we've got. Totally missing the point. And no matter how I tried, could not get that point across that this change in spatial dynamics was something we should be concerned about and watching, not just that the fish were coming closer to the fishing fleets, which is what the main consideration was. So that is, I think, going to be an increasingly important thing that we've got to look at in fisheries, particularly with climate change, because we can expect that this is going to happen. In fact, some of the changes that we have already observed in the Grand Banks could be related, it's hard to know, but could be related not just to short-term environmental changes, but long-term climate change. We're not sure about that. 
And then there's a lot of individual things about the crawl and catch rates, which I won't uh, go into. Uh, I wanted to deal with some myths here. I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to call them myths. Some people might be more gentle and call them hypotheses that were proved incorrect. <laughs> I just want to call them myths because they've taken on a light. You know, a, a science, you know, a scientific hypothesis is something you know, well, which you know we try to test it all. But when it goes outside of that and gets out in the general public, hey, it becomes a myth. You know, even though it's untested, unproven, and blah blah blah. And some of these are, are this. Um, you can read books about this sort of stuff. The first one is that this cloud decline is somehow unique. No way. The first stock that was actually taken down on the Grand Banks was, was had a long time ago, in the 1960s. Now, this, these were actually the first scientific surveys done on the, on the Grand Banks, on for Cough or for Had, which was an important fishery back then. And this is how it went over over a period from 1957 to 1962. Five years, it's kind of going, 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 gone, all within a matter of five years. There's no question that this was this was just fished out. You know, there, there are very good records, very good records. Here's, here's the data in kind of numeric, numeric format. And fish, and then there was a little blip that came from some recruitment about 10 years later, and uh, we cleaned that up pretty fast too. So, what happened to the cod in many ways? Cod, in many ways, was the last fish to go, not the, not the first. We'd seen, this, we'd seen this before, we just didn't want to, want to recognize it. And cod probably survived because they were the most numerous and most robust. They're a lot more robust species than had. They weren't the only ones. We can look at all. I'm only going to show you a couple of examples here. Here's, here's redfish. These are what we can call pulse out fishers in the 60s and 70s. You know, these, these stocks were found, uh, redfish more or less down to, uh, you know, it's, it's at, there still are redfish fisheries, but they're at a very low level. Most, most of the stocks were cleaned out in, within a matter of three or four decades. Grenadier, uh, both of these were pretty well done by the Russians. They, they like these species. We never, we never have, and still don't really fish these species in, in Canada. Um, taken down and gone, and it's all over. So this had happened long before the collapse of the cod. I, I could go on with this, but won't bother. Mm -hmm. Second myth I'd like to slay is uh, the declines occurred mostly in the 1980s. Now, shown you some information about this already, but there was a recent book out by a fellow named Alex Rose, no, no relation to me, but he's a uh, part of scientific journalist in Vancouver, and he, his book is called Who Killed the Grand Banks, or whatever. And it, it's exclusively of about the 1980s. But I know he called me up one day, and I said, well, look, to understand what happened here, you can't just look at the 1980s. You know, this is a 500-year fishery, and most of the decline actually occurred in the 60s. So all you're looking at is kind of a mop-up job. You don't tell a, a, a good story about this, which is what he was trying to do, just by looking at one decade. Anyway, I've showed you enough of that. You should realize that that's not the case. <coughs> myth, uh, myth three is that fisheries were the sole influence on stock declines. Now, there's a, there's a long history to this. This kind of ignores the effect of productivity and also on of uh, ecosystem uh, variability. There's a long history to this one, and it started shortly after the decline. It's kind of come full circle now. Uh, myself and a, uh, an oceanographer at the Memorial, Brad Young, published, I think, what was the first primary publication Relating to the decline way back in 1993. And uh, we were convinced, because we were working on this, that the environment was playing a significant role in what we were seeing. The, uh, of course, overfishing was chief cause of the mortality. It was, it was never really been 
too much of the dispute of that, except recently now that has been disputed, uh, that it was natural mortality. But whatever the case, we were we 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 uh, put forward a, what we could call an environmental model that, that basically said that the people at the time, and this was largely coming out of Ottawa and places that the, the fish will be back in two or three years, you know, don't worry about it. This is more politics than science. Uh, but we said, no, that's not going to happen. It's going to take decades for, for, this to, for this to recover. <clears throat> now, shortly after that, Jeff Hutchins and the late Brand, Brandon Myers uh, published a paper saying that there are paper was basically bunk, and the environment had no influence on the decline whatsoever, and it was all just uh, efficient. And then a whole series of papers came out after that, which are still highly quoted, um, basically predicting rebuilding rates, because, you know, if it was just fishing, there should be nothing else wrong. You take away the fishing, and up she comes again at a predictable rate. It's all a very nice, simple world. Well, unfortunately, it's not. You know, if you took those papers and, and actually believed them, we should, be, we should have millions of tons by now. Or it's just clearly not simple. Now, this has been modified even by some of the same authors over the years, a little bit of backpedaling, I think. But, and there have been a lot of papers come out on the environmental effects. And a couple of recent ones, uh, one by Ray Hillborn and Litzinger, who I don't, do not know, um, and another one in Fisheries Research by Halliday and Pinhorn, which argues that natural mortality was a key factor in this. Um, so we've almost come full circle now. And I think most reasonable people would agree that the environment has played a big. We, we were in a period of poor productivity. You shouldn't have to make apologies. That making that argument means you don't believe in overfishing, which is kind of the way it was in the political side. But you shouldn't have to do that. But for about a decade, you did. I noticed even in Halliday and Pinhorn's paper, they're still very apologetic saying that, oh, yes, we know, you know, we know that it's overfishing and so on, but, but we want to talk about the environment, too. So we still haven't quite got over that. But I think it's fairly clear that both of these factors were working interactively, and how could it be other ones? I talked a little bit about this model, but <coughs> basically, um, without including these factors from the environment, you cannot make any kind of a realistic uh, you know, back projection or retracing of what we know about the fishery on this stock. You cannot do it without including some variability from the environment and also decompensation. I don't want to get into that right now. The other myth that still kicks around is how productive these grand banks are. Again, this is a problem of perception, biomass versus productivity. Grand banks are not particular particularly productive. In fact, they're particularly <coughs> unproductive for the major cod ecosystems of the world. What they do display is huge levels of biomass that remain unproductive and these incredibly high aggregations. I've never seen, and I've looked at echograms from people, if you look at echograms or you can catch rates from trawls, there's never been anything as dense as high in any of the other major cod stocks in the world as, as we can record, even when our stocks are low. Why that is is a really interesting question. I don't have a good answer for that. You can see this, this low product productivity. You know, even at, the, at, at its worst, our annual harvest rates were only in the range of 0.3 to 0.4. Now, if we were looking at some of the other major cod stocks, it's nothing. You know, they fish at those rates all the time, higher. It doesn't crash the stocks. It does here. That should tell you something. And the sustainable period involved keeping the harvest rates well below the average productivity, which is, of course, in the period. Another myth which is still perpetuated is cod will eat anything. Ergo, food web changes and the like don't matter. They'll just eat something else. This is 
this is, I don't know if you know what Coselic is, but it's our endangered species from in Canada, a different department from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, they're convinced that cod will eat anything, therefore it doesn't really matter about any about what's going on in the ecosystem. There's so you gather from, from uh, their reports. Well, there's no question that cod will eat a lot of different things. And you know, you might even be able to argue that they will eat anything, but it's like a starving person, they'll probably eat anything too. It's not what they prefer to eat. I've, I've done experiments in tanks where we brought cod in, not for this reason, but just you know, fooling around with them and, and giving them different kinds of food to eat. You can give them shrimp all day in the end. You know, you can tell that you know, if, they were, if they were people, you'd say, well, they're just turning their nose up at that. If they're really hungry, they'll eat it. You put a cable in there, and boom, they've got it. Put a squid in there, they've got it. They know what they want. And so you might argue that they'll eat anything, but there are certain food sources that are really, really important. And I think that comes out in, in all of those data about their diet uh, from history. And this is really the key to capelin. And uh, a big part of the cod story. Now this is something that's not well known, but capelin crashed just before the cod crash. These are landings, offshore landings, uh, 1970, 1980, 1990. So this was uh, this fishery was out way back in the 70s. It, was, it stopped. So there was virtually only a very small fishery through this whole period. But this is what the biomass estimates did. Now this is in numbers of billions, but this is in millions of tons. Although this is billion. I don't even know what, what's 400, 400,000 billion, whatever, the, whatever that is. It's a lot. Yeah. It went down to actually a, a you know, a speakable number. Within a matter of, of a year or two, just crashed, just before calm. Now, the early accounts of, you know, the fishing only hypothesis, just it totally ignored all of this, what was going on in the ecosystem. But it's clear, if this was the main food of cod, isn't this a problem if you're feeding? <clears throat> and for people, that these are based on acoustic surveys, and there's still a few Neanderthals around who don't believe in acoustic surveys. <coughs> so if you don't believe in acoustic surveys, well, let's look at some other stuff. These, this is the size of the cable. Here, 1990, here's the year, males, females. Uh, two distances, just two different, two different divisions, two different spatial divisions. There's the decline, right, right at the same time. So not at only did their numbers go down, they went to about half the size. Now, you can't, you can't blame that on overfishing. And there's no way you can blame that on lousy acoustic surveys. These are simply measures of the size of the fish. So something clearly happened in the food chain for Caitlin at exactly at that time, which I think has translated into the cod. And we've been doing some <coughs> research as possible. But so many other things. This is the, the mean age of maturity. It, it went way down. Now, now here's an interesting thing. There are, I'm sure some of you have read the papers that ascribing changes in the life history of cod on the Newfoundland. Banks, grand banks, to genetic effects of fisheries. That somehow these are genetically modified by all the fishing pressure, and that's why the age of maturity is, is, is really low. Well then how do you explain this? Because this is clearly not caused by fishing. This is in the same ecosystem, at the same time, this one you cannot ascribe to fishing, and yet you see almost exactly the same effect. <clears throat> we know, now this is some unpublished work, some new stuff, unpublished work, but we've looked at the diets of Caitlin on, on the Grand Banks, and actually in the areas to the south where they're still doing well. This is what the black line is from the Scotian Shelf. This is 
the condition factor over length, and, and you can see that it's, it's substantially higher. It's hard to see all the points, but the lines kind of pick it up. Uh, very, very much reduced on the Grand Banks. Um, and this is not historically uh, the case. So with Capelin, we see this, this mixed thing of massive declines in abundance, halving of their size, decrease in, in their condition. It's got to be related to diet. And sure enough, this is not published yet, but we looked at um, the diets of Capelin and also using isotopes, which I won't show as well, which kind of really pick up the signal nicely. But what you can basically see, this is from the northern Grand Banks, and they're basically eating copepods, which is not a great food for adult cape lines. It's, it's too small. They want to be into euphosids and, and amphipods, the larger, more nutritious <coughs> prey types. There simply aren't any, and haven't been any on the Grand Banks. Now, we know historically uh, amphipods and euphosids were the main food of cape on the Grand Bank. So this represents a major change in their diet. That occurred again at, at exactly the same time. So that's another myth. Now, <clears throat> why am I bothering with this? Why, why is it important to dispel these myths? Well, they, they, they have consequences. I'm only putting things at the myth level that have, you know, they've gone out of science. They're no longer academics arguing back and forth. They've gone into the mainstream, they've gone into the political level, they've gone into the management level, and so on. There were so many predictions that came out of this, a quick rebuilding, and really it led industry down the garden path. And, and honestly, they haven't forgiven us yet. They haven't forgiven science uh, for, for these horrendous predictions, not yet. Um, and it may be a long time before, before they do. And, and from the human standpoint, you know, 40,000 people in Newfoundland alone lost, lost their job. Now, a lot of those people are doing, are in the still in the fishery doing other things, which I'll mention in a minute. But these, it's, it, it's really important that we get this science right. I guess, I guess that's, that's my point. We can't base good fisheries management on myth. So, this is what, you know, in facing the Grand Banks, this is what we got to face. We had sustainable fisheries for 450 years. There's been crises before, but we mined it out basically in a, in a very short period. Got away with it when productivity was high. Faced the consequences when productivity went down. And we basically, the, the, the two things that jump out of me, out of me that we don't really understand are the, are the spatial structure producti and productivity, which includes the food chain. We don't really understand this. And I think this is really important, particularly given the climate change is going to, maybe already has, Effective a lot of this. Now, the fishery didn't stop at more more. In fact, for some people it did very well. But it became a shrimp fishery. These are the landings of shrimp. This is 1990. So you can see it was going up before the decline. There's been a lot of argument, you know, is it is it just uh, cod predation or there's an the environment? It's probably both, probably an environmental. And things were certainly good for shrimp. It was very high production of shrimp beginning in this cold period, and that's gone up. <coughs> this is just a spatial look at it, because again, there are striking spatial features to it. I'll go through this quickly. Crab is the other one. This is the money crop, and has been for, for over a decade. Landings have came up after 1990, substantially. It's quite widespread, although there's strong spatial structure in that uh, as well. And overall, in terms of, you know, for the economists among us, the, uh, the landed value of seafood products just continued to rise. Now, you know, pe people have said that, oh, well, it's a lot better now because the landed value is high, but that kind of ignores a couple of things. One is that, you know, the, the social side of the, of the fishery because not in probably less than half the number of people are needed in, in these crustacean fisheries. It's just job loss. So it creates huge social problems. This has despite the landed value being high. And also we don't really know what cod would have done if they hadn't been kicked out of the equation in here. Because you know they were increasing. This is based on cod. 
and you know then Cog went out of went out of the picture. So you know it's, it's not fair to say that this is just you know some increase wouldn't have happened. Now I want to tell you the most recent news to end up. I'm calling this the Cod Revival. It's now 2010. Shrimp and crab are declining. And at a, for, for industry, an alarming rate. Now some of us have been telling this, trying to tell them this for years, that, you know, look out guys, <clears throat> the day is going to come. And it seems to be approaching fairly quickly. And not all the stocks, again, there's a strong spatial component to this, which we don't understand. Of all of these stocks that we have, they're not all, they never have all done the same. Some are up, some are down, like this. And they're not all recovering at the same rate. I, I just, this is a cartoon, don't take these data to heart too much, but it's a cartoon of the stocks that were under moratorium, not the ones that were kept fishing, because on the Grand Banks, we still have an international fishery that never stopped. So I, you know, eliminating that stock, because that's not a fair comparison, but the stocks that were pretty well fully protected, there seems to be a, a relationship between the recovery lag, that is how long do we have to wait before something happens, and the former size of the stock. In other words, big stocks are going to take longer uh, to recover. That, that seems to be holding good. Some of the small stocks recovered very quickly. Two examples. Out on the Flemish Cat, which is this little stock way out here. This is in international waters. It's not managed by Canada. It's managed by NAFO, North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, an international organization. This stock was, was flat and kind of out for the count for a decade. But just recently, the spawning stock biomass has resurged very, very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, it's a result. Prim uh, primarily not of recruitment. There has been a slight increase in recruitment, but it's a result of growth. And I haven't I haven't got time to show you all that those data, but the uh, basically the fish have doubled the size at age that they were a few years ago. So you've seen an incredible growth spur in this stock. Unfortunately, this is my view now, this is this is the limit spawning stock biomass that they set. Uh, based on what I think is kind of a questionable criteria that this is the lowest point that the stock actually came back from historically. I don't, I don't like that criteria. It kind of indicates that, you know, well, it happened once, therefore it's always going to happen, or whatever. It's just, see, anyway, that's the criteria. So they, they, they have reopened this fishery. So this is the first reopened fishery on, on, the, on the Grand Banks. We'll see what happens. This figure is kind of complicated because it wasn't originally intended for this, but this is this is the heart of the northern cod stock here, and this this is forget this for a minute because this is an inshore population that's actually been declining, different, a different population, and it's declining at the same time that this big stock is increasing. So we've gone from a few thousand tons in the late 90s. It's up well over 100,000 tons in a in very, very short order. So something is happening in the ecosystem again, and we're seeing strong growth. Now, the biomass levels are still a tiny fraction of what they were historically, but this is the first sign of growth that we've seen in this stock since 1990. It's been almost 20 years. So it's, it's a big change. And if we look at that, and I, I I took this, these are, forget the landing side, but this is the landing, this thing here, which has been virtually zero. But this is surplus production. This is where the decline happened. You can see surplus production in the two areas. One is for an area that I've been studying since 1990, which we call the Lana Vista Corridor, which is the main overwintering and spawning area for the northern cod. It has been recently. It wasn't always historically. But this is what surplus production looks from independent biomass surveys. And it's, it's going up very, very quickly, uh, just in the last few years. And this is what the Caitlin Index, now this is just an index from a, a kind of a semi-survey that DFO does because it's very area specific. It's not the full stock. But it does give us some indication that it's supported by industry. 
that we're seeing at exactly the same time a resurgence in Capon. Coincidence? Uh, I don't think so. Now we, we have the problem that we face now in the Grand Banks fisheries is that we seem to have resurgent cod stocks. What are we going to do about it? There's no agreement on, on this whatsoever. And I, what I say is that sustainability, it's really, it's like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. It, 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 depends, it depends on who you ask. And we, there's a tremendous debate, debate going on right now in Newfoundland and Labrador about just what to do with this. Um, some people want to rebuild, kind of, not to exact levels, but kind of rebuild something like the fishery was called uh, flatfish cape, and a multi-species kind of ecosystem. Some people want to do that. Some people just want to sustain the snow crab and shrimp. They, they basically want to kill the cod off as quickly as possible <laughs> because they're afraid that the cod come back, the shrimp and crab are going to go, and these are obviously crab fishing. So a tremendous debate is going on. And these people are serious. They want to cull the cod before they get a chance to come back. And, you know, other people just kind of are more laissez-faire about this. They just want to fish whatever's there, you know. Okay, you know, cod next year, great, you know, whatever. Whatever they can make a dollar out of. <coughs> so, the biggest management challenge we, is just defining what the goal is. You know, what are we trying to do? And you think after 500 years we'd have figured this out. <laughs> and an added problem to this is that we have these, we have this diversity of management systems. Unfortunately, when the 200 mile limits were, were put in place in 1977, whoever figured out 200 lines had never looked at the geography of the Grand Banks. The Grand Banks go well beyond 200 nautical miles from shore. So we have international fisheries on the transboundary stocks, a lot of the stocks, including some of the major ones, move across. We have fishing organization out here, which is you know, its history is kind of wanton destruction. It's hard to really call it much more than that. And we have the inside management by Canada. So we've had, right now we have a situation where the cod stock out here is now open to a fishery, and yet Canadian managers are going to have, go back, have to go back to industry and say our cod stock inside, which is much larger, cannot be fished. It creates a tremendous uh, perception problem. And a tremendous problem for management, and no easy solution to that. <clears throat> so I'll go back to maybe some of the science because I can't solve the management problem. I, where to from here? Well, it, it is a very interesting time in this in this ecosystem, simply because you know I'm as a basically cod capable kind of guy. I've been you know 15 years. It hasn't been fun for the last 15 years basically nothing there, and, and no change, but things are changing very rapidly in our ecosystem right now, so it, it is an exciting time. And I think we need you know, better knowledge and, and models of productivity dynamics. We really need to know when and where these fish stocks are productive, and what those productive levels are, and, and get rid of this idea of constant productivity, which is drag us, drag us down and drag the management down. And, and we need a lot more realistic spatial approaches uh, as well to the fisheries because we know very well that you know it, you can't say that the same thing is going on across all this range of stocks. We know very well it's not. Some of the stocks actually came back, this is not well known, but within a couple of years of a moratorium. Now they were generally the smaller ones, but you know the fundamental question that we should ask is why? Why did this stock here come back, suffer none of these life history things that, that is published in, in the literature. And this other stock, right adjacent to it, suffered all of those things. Why, why did that happen? You know, and the trouble is with the scientific literature, it, it seldom looks at those comparisons. People will take, oh, well, I'm going to look at this stock, and I've now solved all the problems. No. It isn't like that. And you know, we, we just, this is a constant frustration with me and a lot of other fishery scientists in Canada is, is trying to get clear objectives from management and politicians as, as you know, 
where we're going with all of this. This is something we've got to. And I, 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 as, a, as a final comment, perhaps some vision and inspiration might help uh, from the politicians. And with that, I, you know, here's here's my inspirational statement. <laughs> statement of hope. Mark, one of America's great business scientists. <laughs> and I'll end there. Thank you. Not that we know today, which everyone seems to point out quite happily, but 
what was actually available in 1977? Because that was sort of, as I see, one of the, the <coughs> mistakes when the, the, the assumption was made, well, we got rid of the foreigners so we can build up that second offshore yeah. fishery. Could anything have been done that would have led us to a very different place than we are today? Oh, yes, I, I definitely think it could have been. And, you know, the, uh, the science that was done at the time, it, it's there. You know, it's just that um, we had this um, Kirby report that was done, and this was a high-level government report that was done in the late 70s, that basically took the most optimistic view. I mean, there was so much uncertainty in the projections, but that was clearly spelled out. If you read the scientific advice at that time, it was clearly spelled out that, you know, this was based on, on recruitment and, and growth pro projections based on what, it, what had happened in previous decades, and that this could be entirely wrong. So while people didn't really know what the right answer was, the, the cautions were there. If we had been taking a precautionary approach, it never could have led to the expansion of the Canadian trawler fleet that, that happened. Not only that, you know, politics always comes into this, because the main expansion of the Canadian trawler fleet did not occur in Newfoundland, it occurred in Nova Scotia. And that was entirely politics. So, yes, I, 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 you know, now, one of the problems with marine science is, you know, we're, we can't experiment, right? We've got one-off situations, there are no controls. You know, I, I've often wondered, you know, what would have happened, for example, given the productivity declines that occur, what would have happened if there had been no fishing at all? I mean, I kind of think that, that uh, the cod stocks would have declined considerably, as they did in the 19th century, but they probably would not have crashed. You know, it was, it was the overfishing on top of that that really made that happen. So, I don't know, it is, uh, the attitude that came across in the late 70s was, it was, there was a euphoria that was entirely unwarranted. Now again, I agree with you, a lot of this is hindsight, you know, and it's hard to know. But, you know, having read the science and, and, and what came out of the science, how it was interpreted by management and, and more seriously by politicians at the time, they should have been a lot more cautious about the regrowth pattern that the stock would take. And if they had done that, we probably wouldn't have crashed the stock like we did. Uh, well, you say it's really not challenges are getting some kind of either consensus or, or dictum about you know where what we want to achieve with these fisheries. One of, one of the another one of the mistakes uh, back to Andre's question that was made in the in the in the, uh, in the 80s was trying to do everything with the fishery. And there are some really good quotes from reports about about this from that time period. Because traditionally you see we had a coastal seasonal fishery. Now, it was not, you know, ec economists hated. And when, when Newfoundland joined Canada in 1949, you know, the economic thrust was basically, you know, this small boat fishery's got to go with that. And, th and that, that was not just, uh, you know, an imposed policy from outside. It came from within Newfoundland as well. That this was a thing of the past, get rid of it, you know, blah, blah, blah it's over. But it didn't go away. And on top of that, people wanted an industrialized, year-round trawler fishery, which never worked either. But they wanted everything from the fishery. Nobody could decide, look, you can't, you can't do both of these, you can't do it all. We can't have, you know, the objective of the fishery cannot be economic of fishery and deploying the most number of people on the coast. It, it, it can't work. And nobody, no politician, was willing to make those kind of hard decisions. And now that translates into right now, where we've got, we can't seem to get a firm direction on where we want to go. Do we want, I mean, specific questions have to be answered. Do we want to rebuild these cod stocks or not? You know, the, the, the biological potential to do that, which has been debated for 
um, ever since the stocks went down. It, it's pretty clear now that it, that it can happen. We waited a while, but it's pretty, it can happen. But do we want it to happen? That's a question. A lot of people, a lot of fishing industry in Newfoundland do not want it to happen. So, you know, that, yeah, I don't think that's the majority of opinion, but these are pretty basic questions about where we want to go. I mean, clearly, if we want to rebuild the cod fisheries, we should not start fishing yet. They're way below any level that even approaches what, you know, an optimum yield could be. They could produce a tremendous amount more for the fishery if their spawning biomass was, was allowed, allowed to increase. But these are fundamental decisions which are going to feed through management that, that have to be made. And uh, we, we're not there yet. I mean, I, I don't know what else I can say. That, uh, and and what, we, what we've ended up doing, and it got us into all this trouble in the beginning, is because we don't have clear objectives. You know, it's kind of like you get up in the morning, and if you don't know where, to, where you're going, you're surely going to get there. And that's what we've been doing, bumbling along, bumbling through, just hoping things will turn out right. And, and, and it doesn't work. Sorry, but I have a clear objective to suggest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we must be parched. So I'd like to thank George again for his talk.